The following program is sponsored by the Hope Team, friends and partners of Keith Nix Ministries. Coming up on The Lift with Keith and Margie Nix. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay. Listen to me. When God forgives you, he does not say to you, your sin's okay. It costs Jesus his life. So Keith Nix's sin, no matter how small, has never been okay with God. But God looks at Keith Nix today and doesn't see a sinner, but he sees one of his sons because of the blood of Jesus. So it's not okay, it's let go. Welcome today to The Lift. I am delighted that you're with us today, and I'm honored. It is our honor to bring the Word of the Lord, the living Word of God, to you every single week via this media. Hey, would you take a moment? Let somebody know that we're airing, wherever you're watching this from, text a friend, uh, call a neighbor, go out on the street, and yell real loud, do something, let people know they can get in on this because today we're continuing our series, Uncommon Release. Just have today and next week. And I want to tell you something. When I preached these messages at the lift, uh, something happened in the atmosphere. Lives were changed forever. People were talking about the freedom they walked into. They were talking about the revelation they received of what forgiveness is. What's the power of walking in the release Jesus has for you? So uh, invite somebody to watch. If you can't see it all, if you didn't see all of the last two weeks, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in The Lift with Keith and Margie Nix, and there you can watch every episode. You can subscribe so that every week when we upload a new episode, you're one of the first people to know about it. And uh, we'd love to have you join the team that way. Speaking of teams, uh, it is an honor to have the Hope Team with us. The Hope Team are friends and partners of this ministry that pray for us and financially contribute to help us do what God's called us to do in reaching this generation. And if you'd consider being part, the information's on the screen. We'd love for you to prayerfully consider joining the team, becoming a partner with this ministry, and impacting this generation for the glory of God and for good in everyone we're privileged to touch. Today, we're jumping into a message again about release, and uh, I'm going to come back at the end of this time. I'm going to pray with you, spend a few more moments with you, and believe God for your miracle. Right now, you can, you can text us wherever you are. You can write us. You, you can email us. Reach out to us. Let us know your prayer requests. And let me mention that one, one thing we do at The Lift, every Monday night for four and a half years now, I think, every Monday night, we're gathered together in the auditorium for corporate prayer. And it is a powerful, life-changing time. We, we transact kingdom business every week in a very special, dedicated, devoted, and focused time of prayer. And if you have a prayer need, we'd love to lift that specific need to the Lord during that time. So again, just contact us and let us know how we can pray with you. Well, let's go into the message where we're gonna learn more about walking in the power of forgiveness. In fact, today I'm sharing a little glimpse of my dad's testimony. Man, what a testimony. It's gonna change your life. Stay with us. Many of you don't know my dad's testimony, but my, my dad was, was horribly abused as a child, went through things he's still unwilling to talk to us about, and, uh, uh, and, and, and God moved and made him a promise, and his, my grandmother, we were never really welcome around her house because what was in her hated. Dad got saved. Nine years old, he tried to kill his mom and his stepdad with a butcher knife. 
tried to murder them. That was all his heart was because they'd abused him so. And, and, uh, and his heart was filled with hate. But at the age of 10, he got gloriously born again, watching a television preacher. Yeah, hallelujah. He prayed a prayer. Jesus came into his heart, turned his life around. At the age, hallelujah, of 10 years old, he, he would never be the same again. Started preaching the gospel at the age of 11. Hallelujah. And, and his mother called him when he was 13 and said, I'm coming over there to blow your brains out. Uh, you're such an embarrassment to the family. He said, Mom, you mean, you mean the family that's all drunks and druggies and, and, and I'm the embarrassment? She said, yes. She said, I hate your guts. And I, he said, you can't kill me, Mom. She said, I can shoot. You know I can. He said, Mom, I'm, it's, I'm not worried about your ability to shoot. You can't kill me. In fact, he said, the Lord Jesus has made me a promise that if I'll just be faithful to him, he's going to save you one day. Hallelujah. Well, years went by and, and, and my little mamma had an encounter with Jesus on her, on her, on a bed in a hospital just a few hours before she had passed away. Four o'clock in the morning, Jesus walked into the room and said to her, I have come to fulfill a promise to your son and to my son. I am Jesus of now. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody help me. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so, so she, <laughs> she was born again. I'm going to see her again one day. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And when I see her again, there's not going to be that distance between us. Dad went to the hospital about six o'clock. God had told him not to go the night before. I didn't intend to tell all this. This is for somebody. God, Dad got in the hospital room about six o'clock. He obeyed the Lord. The Lord told him he's going the night before. And God said, don't go wait till early in the morning. He said, Lord, they say she'll die. And the Lord spoke to his, to his heart and said, I'll take care of her. Wait till early in the morning. When he got there, nobody else was in the room. He walked over to her bed and she looked up and said, oh, Larry, is it you? He said, yes. She said, a man came in my room about four o'clock. And she told him the story. And she, she reached up, body cancer field, the stench of death and cancer all over. And she said, Larry, can I give you a hug? He said, yeah, he'd, want, he'd waited for that hug since he was a 10 year old boy. Hallelujah. She said, the Lord said he fulfilled a promise to you. And he did. He prayed for her to be healed. He wanted to, she said, no son, I've got to go on. And and she left him one request that he preach her funeral. It's a challenging day. I was just a little boy. But I can vaguely remember that day. It's a challenging day, but here's what happened at that funeral. The Lord instructed him after he had preached to go over and hug his stepfather who had abused him so, whom he had tried to murder. He said, go give him a hug and tell him you forgive him. And my dad did. You're never more like Jesus than when you can look at someone who's hurt you and wounded you and forgive them. We looked last week at the apostle Paul and in Acts chapter 9. Verse 26 to 28. I'm not going to read it again for the sake of time today. But the, the church embraced this murderer. They embraced this, this, this vile man. A religious man. But a man who in the name of religion. In the name of God. Had abused their families. Had murdered. Had, had arrested. Had beaten. Had, had led a crusade to try to stamp out these Jesus followers. And yet, you know the story in Acts chapter 9, Saul encounters the Lord Jesus on the way to Damascus, and he's gloriously saved and changed, hallelujah. And, and so, uh, he's born again, and the change is miraculous. How many are glad that when God saves us, it is a miraculous change that takes place? I feel like shouting. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. Anybody remember what it's like to be born again. Will you go ahead and give him a shout of praise? Thank you, Lord. I mean, 
Saul was gloriously saved. He started preaching the gospel. Then he went into the wilderness. And after a few months or even years, he goes to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, the apostles are naturally afraid of him. They think it's a ruse. And they're struggling with this man who has been so abusive to them. But in Acts chapter 9, 26 to 28, they embrace him. At the minute, Barnabas leads the way and they embrace him. How many are glad that there is a power from heaven that allows you to be so released from fear and bitterness and the past that you can embrace someone that you used to run from? Hallelujah. Last week, last week, Corey Ten Boom tag team preached with me just a little bit. I enjoyed it so much. I'm going to let her tag team with me again, if it's all right. I read to you, I don't have time to reread it, but I read to you a portion of an article that she wrote. I want to pick up where I ended last week. And, and, and so I want you to listen. I'm going to pick up with the very last sentence that I read last Sunday. If you were not here, if you missed it, go back to the archives. Please catch it because it's going to minister to you in a powerful way. But Corey Tim Boom said, said, for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands. The former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And having thus learned to forgive. Now, now watch this. Listen close. And having thus learned to forgive in this hardest of situations. You remember she, she was grasping the hand of a guard, at, a former guard at Ravensbrook where her sister had died in that concentration camp in the Holocaust, where she had been humiliated and abused herself. And she was forgiving him and grasping his hand. So she said, having thus learned to forgive in this hardest of situations, I never again had difficulty in forgiving. I wish I could say it. I wish, she wrote, I could say it. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from me from then on, but they didn't. If there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but only draw them fresh from God each day. Come on, it's going to help somebody. I can't store up good feelings and good behavior, but only draw them fresh from God each day. Maybe I'm glad it's that way, she writes, for every time I go to him, he teaches me something else. I recall the time some 15 years ago when some Christian friends whom I loved and trusted did something which hurt me. You would have thought that having forgiven the Nazi guard, this would have been child's play. It wasn't. For weeks I seethed inside. But at last I asked God again to work his miracle in me, and again it happened. First the cold-blooded decision, then the flood of joy and peace. Come on. Forgiveness is what? First, the cold-blooded decision. It's not feeling it. It's deciding it. Then, she said, the flood of joy and peace. I had forgiven my friends. I was restored to my father. Then, why was I suddenly awake in the middle of the night, hashing over the whole affair again? My friends, I thought. People I loved. If it had been strangers, I wouldn't have minded so. I sat up, switched on the light. Father, I thought it was all forgiven. Please help me to do it. But the next night I woke up again. They had talked so sweetly too. Never a hint of what they were planning. Father, I cried in alarm, help me. His help came in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor to whom I confessed my failure after two sleepless weeks. Up in that church tower, he said, nodding out the window, is a bell which is rung by pulling on a rope. But you know what? After you let go of the rope, 
the bell keeps swinging. First ding, then dong. Slower and slower until there's a final dong and it stops. I believe the same thing he said is true of forgiveness. When we forgive someone, we take our hand off the rope. But if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the ding dongs of the old bell slowing down. And so it proved to be. There were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in my conversation. But the force, which was my willingness in the matter, had gone out of them. They came less and less often and at last stopped altogether. So I discovered another secret of forgiveness. That we can't trust God that we can trust God not only above our emotions, but also above our thoughts. Come on. If I don't preach anything else, somebody's going to get freed if you'll grab hold of this. We can trust God not only above our feelings, but somebody lift up your hand and say also above my thoughts. And still he had more to teach me even in this single episode because many years later in 1970, an American with whom I had shared the ding dong principle came to visit me in Holland and met the, the people involved. Aren't those the friends who let you down? He asked as they, as they left my apartment. Yes, I said a little smugly. You can see it's all forgiven. By you, yes, he said. But what about them? Have they accepted your forgiveness? They say there's nothing to forgive. They deny it ever happened, but I can prove it. I went eagerly to my desk. I have it in black and white. I saved all their letters and I can show you where. Corey, my friend slipped his arm through mine and gently closed the door. Aren't you the one whose sins are at the bottom of the sea? And are the sins of your friends etched in black and white? For an anguishing moment, I could not find my voice. Lord Jesus, I whispered at last. Lord Jesus, who takes away all my sins, forgive me for preserving all these years the evidence against others. Give me grace to burn all the blacks and whites as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to your glory. I did not go to sleep that night until I had gone through my desk and pulled out those letters, curling now with age, and fed them all into my little coal-burning grate. As the flames leaped and glowed, so did my heart. Forgive us our trespasses, Jesus taught us to pray, as we forgive those who trespass against us. In the ashes of those letters, I was seeing yet another facet of his mercy. What more he would teach me about forgiveness in the days ahead, I didn't know. But tonight's was good news enough. When we bring our sins to Jesus, he not only forgives them, he makes them as if they had never been. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Come on, how many have some things to learn yet about forgiveness? Let me just remind you in the few moments we have together that forgiveness, we said it last week, let me say it again, forgiveness is to wipe the slate clean. Forgiveness is to cancel a debt owed. It is to release, to let go, to send away a grievance that someone has committed against you. It is, watch this, forgiveness is to let go of your right to hurt someone who hurt you. I added this one. It is also to let go of any sense of pleasure you sense when you see them being hurt by circumstances. Oh, I'm going to get quiet. You know what I mean. They did you wrong, and, and there is a law called reaping and sowing, and so later in their life, some things are happening, and you hear about it and see about it, and there's a little, there's a little, mm-hmm, Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, did you hear about so? Oh, it's sad, isn't it? But there's a little grin. Because you're just a little bit happy that they're reaping. Oh, I'm losing amens in here. Come on. Forgiveness means I let that go. I let that pleasure go. I'm not happy when my enemy is destroyed. I'm crying, have mercy on them. Come on, hallelujah. Look over at somebody and say, he might make you mad, but he'll make you free if you'll grab hold of it. Or as Jamie Buckingham once wrote, the truth will make you free, but first it'll make you miserable. Forgiveness is a choice. Somebody say it's a choice, not a feeling. And when you choose to forgive your feelings, hear me, your feelings will eventually match up to your decision. But you choose, I love the way Corey Ten Boom put it, you make the cold-blooded decision. I forgive. And then the joy and the peace come later. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay. Listen to me. When God forgives you, he does not say to you, your sin's okay. It cost Jesus his life. So Keith Nix's sin, no matter how small, has never been okay with God. But God looks at Keith Nix today and doesn't see a sinner, but he sees one of his sons because of the blood of Jesus. So it's not okay, it's let go. I hope that you're learning something about forgiveness. Hope you're learning what forgiveness isn't. And I hope you're learning what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision. Saying I forgive you to someone is not saying what you did to me is okay. Because our sin before God wasn't okay. It cost Jesus his life. Jesus paid the ultimate price because of your sin and my sin. He died. And so sin is never okay. Wrong and hurt is never okay. But what forgiveness does, it says it's not okay, but I send it away. It's not that it's okay, but I choose to forgive it, to let it go. I choose to release it, to cancel the debt. I choose to say, uh, I, I'm not going to try to to get back at you. I'm not going to try to get even with you. I'm not going to try to, I don't want to rejoice when you're hurt, even though you hurt me. Forgiveness is saying, I'm done with it. I let it go. I'm moving forward. And thank God that's what God has done with our sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he takes our sin and cast it into the sea. I love what little Corey Ten Boom said. She said, when God takes your sin, when you repent of your sin and you ask him to be Lord of your life and forgive you, he takes that sin and throws it into the sea and puts a no fishing sign there. He says, I'm not going to remember it anymore. I'm not going to live thinking about you, recalling your, your bad deeds. No, he said, I forget it. I, I, I release it. Now look, when God forgets it, it's not that he doesn't have the ability to recall it. He's God. He knows everything. But he chooses to never recall your sin again. He chooses to see you not as you were, but as you are. And in reality, he sees you as you are becoming. And so I want to encourage you to walk in forgiveness. It begins with being forgiven. It begins with a true repentance. It begins, you know, uh, someone can never be truly free of something until they truly face it, until they come clean about it. They really can't be clean from it. And so if people, you know, you've had people, well, if, if, I, if I've done anything to hurt you, if I have, I can't think what it might be, but if I have, please forgive me. No, look, they're, they're not. Now, I can forgive them. I can just say, okay. I can, but, but if they're not going to come clean about it, they're really not going to walk in freedom from it. And so it is with our sin before God. To confess our sin is to say about our sin what God says about it. Some people never fully get free from sin because they keep excusing it. I want to challenge you right now. Don't excuse sin. Say about it what God says about it. It cost Jesus everything. 
It cost Jesus his life. And so when I repent of my sin, when I confess it, I say about it what God says about it. Then according to 1 John 4, 9, he is faithful. He is just. He will forgive. He will send it away from me. Hallelujah. And he'll cleanse me. He'll, he'll, there'll be a catharsis in my life. He'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So he'll not only deal with the symptom, he'll deal with the, the disease as well. But you got to come clean. So I just want to pray with you right now. Maybe you've been in church for years, but, but there's some things you keep excusing. You want to be free from it? Say about it what God says about it. Confess your sin and know that he's faithful and just to forgive you. Maybe condemnation's beating you up. You've tried to confess, but you're just getting beat up. No. No, 1 John 4, 9 says, when you say about it what God says about it, he is the faithful one. He is just. He will forgive you. He'll send it away, dismiss it from you, never to remember it again, and he'll cleanse you from the very root issue. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, will you pray right now? Just say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. It cost you everything. And I, I want to be done with it. I want to be free from it. Forgive me and cleanse me. In Jesus' name, Father, I'm making Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm coming back to you today, and I thank you. I'll never be the same. As you pray that prayer right now, he's answering. And Father, I add my faith to theirs that in the name of Jesus, they're going to be free. And Lord, I pray that they'll be able to forgive those that have harmed them and hurt them. And they'll move forward now in the destiny you have for them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'd love to get to know you better. Information's on the screen. I got a little booklet I'd love to send you about the power of this new life. We'd love to pray for you. Contact us. Come visit us at The Lift in Sevierville, Tennessee. Man, that'd be awesome to see you here. We're looking forward to it. Until next week, remember, Jesus is Lord. Let him be the Lord of your life. This is the Lift Church app, a simple yet powerful way to stay connected. From the convenience of your phone, you can stream live services. Need a replay? No problem. Browse through our fully loaded archive. Find out about upcoming events and so much more. Best of all, it's free. Visit the App Store today to get your download.